guessing the ones that I see here, we won't see next Sunday. A lot of shaking heads there. Yeah, okay. All right. But it's good to have everybody here this morning. Um, if you're visiting with us and you've never been to our church before, in the morning service, the next hour, we will have our ushers pass through the audience and just hand out some cards so that we can get some contact information from you. And we'd appreciate it if you'd fill that out for us so that we can follow up with you uh, later on this week. Um, our um, verse challenge, our annual challenge, has a different verse for each month. And so in here, in the mornings, we've been saying the last month's verse and the current month's verse. So if you need to look up Ephesians, I better get the, I don't have it in front of me. Ephesians 4.32, and then that's last month's verse. And if you need it, um, like I do, Isaiah 6.8 for this month. We'll read those or quote those, and then we'll take up our Sunday school offering. So we'll do last month's verse first together. Ephesians 4.32. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. And then this month's verse, Isaiah, together, Isaiah 6.8. Then also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. All right, we'll have our ushers come at uh, this time, and we'll take up our Sunday school offering. The ladies will be playing a song to get us thinking about this season. Christ the Lord is risen today. And um, as we take up the offering... Brother Leek, will you lead some prayer as we receive the offering? Father, we thank you for the blessing that you're here today. We thank you for Mr. Berman. Father, we thank you for this congregation that you've gathered here this morning. We thank you for the bless this offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, let's take our Bibles and turn to Romans this morning. Let's, uh, we'll begin at Romans 7. We're going to spend most of our time in Romans 8. We're going to finish up the last point of pity parties, the pitfall of pity parties. 
spent, spent a, lot, a while here already, so we want to give a little preventative uh, instruction here. We talked about some problems in the pit, then we discovered uh, what we should be doing is making some prayers in the pit. We talked about how God uh, used, uh, helped different people who prayed when they were tempted to have a pity party and when they began to have pity parties. Look at uh, a few different men there. And now we want to look uh, thirdly, our third main point is protection against the pit. So how do we prevent ourselves from falling prey to these pity parties? Well, let me just say, you're going to be tempted because you've got a weak flesh. We all have a weak flesh, and our flesh wants to cater to itself, typically. Um, and, and we're going to have trials throughout life, and there are going to be things that are going to get us down. And it's going to be easy for us to focus on ourselves and focus on our problems. And we'll be tempted to feel sorry for ourselves. And then we have a choice to make. What are we going to do? Focus on these problems or focus on the problem solver? We know which one we should do, but we know which one's a whole lot easier to do. So let's pray and we'll get uh, into the lesson. Father, we thank you for the Bible and it help that it gives to us, and I need help and strength as I try to present the truth to your people today, and I would ask, Lord, that you uh, would meet each need here. Truly, you give us so much in salvation, and perhaps there are some here who uh, have never received Christ as Savior, never repented of sin, and they still... Uh, are without the Holy Spirit of God living within them to help them through these difficult times that they face. And so, Lord, I pray, whatever our spiritual needs are, that we would find them met in you and in your word today. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the Apostle Paul, I want to begin here in Romans 7. The Apostle Paul was, uh, found himself frustrated and discouraged because he constantly battled uh, his weak flesh. You ever find yourself in that position? <laughs> Frustrated and discouraged because, man, the things I shouldn't be doing, I'm doing, and I, I told myself I'm not doing those things anymore, and I keep falling prey to that. Um, and so I want to show you a few verses here in chapter 7 that will help us to uh, to dive in a little bit more into chapter 8. So in verse, chapter 7, verse number 19, look at what he said here. Uh, For the good that I would, I do not. So the, go the good that I would do, I, I don't do it. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So there are some good things that I know I should be doing, and I, I would do those, but I don't. And there's some bad things that I shouldn't be doing and I don't want to do, but I do them. So he's discouraged about this. And then we uh, drop uh, down to verse 23. He says, I see, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So there's this law of sin that he's talking about. And that law of sin was, is in his members. It's in his body. It's in his flesh. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So he's, again, he's frustrated. Who, who's going to deliver me from this? This, this? this body's got the law of sin in it, and it keeps pulling me down, and and. He's a saved man. He's a regenerated man. He wants to do what's right, but there's something pulling him in the other direction. And, and we like to blame the devil. It's not always the devil. It was his flesh that wanted to pull him in the, in the wrong direction. But thankfully, he did find a remedy uh, to prevent himself uh, from feeling sorry for himself. And now we find that there in verse number 25. He says, so he asked the question uh, in, in verse 24, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he says in verse 25, here's the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
So that's the answer. The answer is Jesus. Uh, and what we need is Jesus. And, and people, there are people in this world who, they get themselves in a lot of trouble. They get, they get down, they get discouraged, and uh, they, they, they reap from sin. And they, what they want a lot of times is their problems to be all taken away. But they don't want Jesus. They don't want him to come in and give them righteousness. They just want their problems gone. I'm sorry, the problems aren't going away until you get Jesus to come into your life and forgive you. What we need is Christ and his righteousness, not just uh, the removal of all problems, okay? So he turned his focus to the Lord Jesus Christ, and in chapter 8, he lists several things uh, that, that we should remember when we're feeling down, okay? So I'm tying this together by saying here he is. He's, he's, he's frustrated with himself. He's, he's discouraged because he can't do what he should do, and I won't say he's having a pity party, but he's down, and he could certainly get to that place, but he didn't let him stay, himself stay there. He looked in the right direction. He's got his eyes on the Lord, took his eyes off of his problem. By the time we get through chapter 8, you're going to see he's not down in the dumps anymore. He's quite victorious, and that's where we ought to be. If we're down and discouraged and, and tired of the battle, you can read about that in chapter 7. I didn't go through the whole thing. But uh, chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Romans are, are a great uh, set of uh, chapters to read when you're, when you're battling yourself and battling discouragement and, and, and all of that. And then you get into chapter 8, and it's a, it's a chapter of great victory. So notice a few things, or several things that we're going to see that Paul saw once he got his eyes off himself. So what did he see? First of all, we see, he saw God's power. He saw God's power. We find this here in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. He says, therefore, uh, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, I'm going to, continue here in just a moment, but that's a beautiful uh, truth right there. There's no condemnation to those, everyone who's in Christ Jesus. Condemnation. I mean, sin condemns us to eternal punishment. We're, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when we sin, sin condemns us to hell. There is no escaping hell of our own power. And he said, but there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Didn't say to them which are in the church. Church membership doesn't get you out of, out of hell. It doesn't say uh, there's no condemnation to them which are, have been in the waters of baptism. None of that. Baptism's not going to save you. Church membership's not going to save you. The only way we can escape the condemnation of hell, the punishment that we deserve because of our sin, is by having Jesus in our lives and being in him positionally by receiving him as our Savior. He says, and then continues there, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Once we receive Christ as our Savior. He gives us the Holy Spirit of God to live with inside of us. And he guides us and teaches us in so many other things. Now, it's important that when we do repent of our sin and receive Christ that we understand that the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. He changes us. He makes us new. There's so much that goes on. We'll see a little bit of that as we go along in the chapter. Um, but in verse number two, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So remember we looked back there in chapter 7, the end of verse 23, talked about the law of sin, he said, which is in my members. There's this law that just in, in me, in my flesh, it wants to sin, it wants to be bad. But now he's talking about a different law. He's talking about a higher law. And he said the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free. Free from what? Free 
from the law of sin and death. Meaning we don't have to be totally dominated by whatever our flesh tells us to do. Absolutely. We do not have to live to the passions and the dictates of our flesh. Now, you can choose to follow your flesh, but you don't have to because there's a higher law. And he realized, yes, there's this battle. There's, my flesh wants to be bad. It wants to do bad. He says, but the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, and it's a higher law that overcomes and counteracts and resists and goes against the law of sin and death. Not a perfect illustration, but uh, an illustration I've used, oh, probably several years ago. Here's a set of keys, and if I, I'm holding up my keys, and if I let go of my keys, what happens to them? Imagine. Why? Because there's a law called gravity that pulls them down. The law is in effect right now. But there's another law, uh, resistance, that's, hold, that, that's working against that law of gravity that's uh, um, keeping them from falling down. Right? That's why I try to keep at least one foot on the ground all the time so I'm not falling down. Uh, and, and so the Holy Spirit, our flesh wants to sin, but the Holy Spirit can counteract that and, and overcome that and resist that and give us victory over sin. And once we see that uh, God can help us overcome our problems... Because he has the power to help us overcome the problems, there's no need to have what? A pity party. There's no need. Because we see that God is all powerful and he can help and intervene in any situation. So, this is one of the things that Paul saw, and I'm going to have to really move, otherwise, we won't get through this. And I'm not going to uh, teach and preach the whole chapter, but we're going to hit some highlights as we go along. Look at the second thing. So we saw, first of all, God's power. Secondly, he saw God's promise. We find this down there in verse number 10. And if, the, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now here's the promise that uh, the, he's, the spirit of God gives life. He gives life. He's actually back in verse 2. He's called the spirit of life. And then down here, uh, he, this says the spirit is life because of right. So he gives us life. So we don't have to feel lifeless. We don't have to feel defeated. We don't have to be discouraged and thinking there's no hope. Why? Because when we're in that situation, we're having a pity party, but we don't have to have any of that because the Spirit of God dwells in every believer, and because of that, we have life. We have the potential for victory if we want it. Isn't it a blessing how God's Word just gives us what we need? So, we have God's power. We have God's promise. Next thing that Paul saw, I'm going to point out, is uh, we have God's presence. Again, if we're saved, if, if we've received Christ as our Savior, he's given us the Holy Spirit to live within us. And we find this here in verses 14 through 16. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Not everyone's a son of God, uh, you have to repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Receive him as your Savior. Well, anyway, he gives us the Holy Spirit, and, and he, he'll lead us, and those who have him are the sons of God. Verse 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, this is interesting here, too. So, He's called the spirit of life. And here in this verse, he's called the spirit of adoption. He adopts us into his family. I was not born into this world as a child of God. I had to be adopted. That happened when I repented of my sin 
and received Christ as my Savior. Then I entered into the family of God. I didn't deserve to be in his family. No one deserves to be in his family. But he adopted me in. And people look at adoption as kind of a, oh, that's, that's like, ooh, you're not an original. You're adopted. I'm sorry. Being adopted, that means someone chose to let me in. And that's even, that's, that's very special to me, that God chose to let me in. I didn't deserve to be part of his family, but he chose to uh, have me as his child. So now uh, we've received the spirit of adoption. He says, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have a close personal relationship with the Father. A lot of people in this world have religion. They don't have a relationship with the Father. They go to church week after week. They believe in God, but they're not saved. They believe that he exists, but they don't know him. They have a little bit of knowledge of him. They go to a church that maybe he's not opening the Bible, not really explaining the truth, not really showing people uh, the way of salvation. And so they, they hope, but they don't really know what they're looking for. And I'm thankful that when we find Christ as our Savior, he gives us the Holy Spirit to live within us. He adopts us, and he, he er, uh, yearns in our heart and helps us to be able to, to pray, Abba, Father, just a close relationship with God. And in verse number 16... The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so the Holy Spirit, one of his, his ministries is to tell us, yeah, you're saved. Or to tell us, hey, you're not saved. He'll tug in our heart and say, you know, you need a real, no, but I have got baptized. No, no, you need to this. <laughs> uh, you need to repent and trust me as Savior. Oh, but I joined the church. I've been religious all my life. That, those things don't matter. They matter in the sense that if you've been in church all your life, I mean, that's helpful because you've, you've heard some of the Bible and some of the truth and hopefully some of those things have built on, but that's not going to get any of us into heaven no matter how old we are. I remember witnessing to a 95-year-old man in the hospital. He was laying on, in the hospital bed next to my grandfather, and 95 years old, religious all his life, I, I believe he was a Roman Catholic, wasn't saved, I witnessed to him, and I remember that uh, he prayed and, and trusted Christ as his Savior. 95, that's hard to repent when you're that old, to repent and say, I was believing the wrong thing all this time. And but we need to humble ourselves because we'll never get into the kingdom of God unless we humble ourselves and become as little children. So the Spirit of God lives in us. He doesn't want us to live in fear. He's, again, we don't have to fear, and that's what happens sometimes. We get in a pity party. We're fearing what's going to happen. What's gonna, I don't know this, how this is going to work out. And he says right there um, that, he, he, that we, we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, so the Holy Spirit helps us, enables us. We don't have to live that way. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. He assures us. He bears witness with our spirit. He lets us know that we're God's children. And that's important too. Not only gives us assurance of salvation, but if the Holy Spirit, if I'm saved and the Holy Spirit's living within me and I'm having a tough time, you know, part of his ministry is say, hey, you're one of God's children. He's going to take care of you. You know, I have three children. They grew up in my house. I did the best I could to take care of them. Was I a perfect parent? Absolutely not. But I, I cared for my kids. And I tried to make sure that they got what they need. They got the food they need. They got the shelter they need. They got the home that they need. They got the education and the training and the discipline. I tried to do everything I could to make sure that their needs were met. Now, there are some things that they thought probably they needed, but they didn't need, and I didn't give everything that they wanted. But I try to meet their needs. Now, that's me as a fallen human being. Our Heavenly Father, who loves, 
much more than we could ever love. And it is, is all wise, cares for us, and wants to help us. And because he is our Heavenly Father and we have assurance that he's our Heavenly Father, we can talk to ourselves and, and actually listen to the Holy Spirit as he talks to us and bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. And we can say, hey, I'm one of God's children. He's going to take care of me. He's going to take care of these problems. I don't have to live in the pit. Why do God's children insist on living in the pit? It's not where God wants us. We're going to have problems, yes. We're going to have hardships. We're going to have heartaches. All of that, we've talked about those things. But God doesn't want us to dwell on those things. He wants us to stay focused on him and realize we've got his power, we've got his presence, we've got his promise that he's going to help us. And so we move on to the next one. In verse number 18, we see God's perspective. This is another thing here that uh, Paul saw that helped him, that can help us as well. He says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Have you ever done something right and then, as a result of it, you had problems? You know, maybe God led you to give a little extra, so you gave a little extra. And then, you know, the transmission goes out on your vehicle. Lord, you know, you knew this expense was coming. Why did you have me give extra? I needed that. Maybe he just wanted you to trust him. <laughs> you know, there are so many times where we, we, we try to do something good and right, and then it seems like there's a problem that follows it. And we have to see things as God sees them. Let me read that verse again in, in, after giving you that example. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. God doesn't look negatively at our problems. You ever thought of that? Oh no, you have a health problem. That's terrible. He doesn't look negatively at our problems. He actually has a plan for them. Now, I don't believe God call, causes every problem in the world. Do you? If you do, then you've got a different view of God. Now, he may allow some things to happen, but even the, the, the bad things he allows to happen, he has a purpose for allowing it. We have to trust him in those things. But Paul realized that he needed to look past his troubles and toward the rewards that awaited him in glory. And if we're looking at our problems, we're going to get pretty discouraged and, and things in this life because, you know, even the things in this life, they don't last forever. We put, we put all the hopes in, in all of these things and they, they don't bring lasting satisfaction. You get that brand new car that you've always wanted and then you park next to somebody else who didn't care about your brand new car and you come back and there's this big dent in the side of your door and you wanting to put a big dent in the side of someone's head. Now, that's not a good thing to, to do, by the way. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, well, we've got to look past those, those present troubles. And, 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 and we'll be more comp... I'm going to say this. We're going to be more than compensated for our sufferings here once we get to heaven. If you have to suffer for the Lord in any way, you think he's going to be your debtor? No, no. And so we should then again look at those problems and say, okay, God's got a plan, and I'm going to be rewarded for, if I'm suffering for righteousness, then I'll be rewarded for getting through this and trusting him in it. Let me move on to the next one. Uh, another thing that encouraged Paul and helped him stay out of the pit 
should help us also, is God's prayer. You say, God's prayer? I thought we pray to God. Yes. But I want you to see here in, uh, that's a familiar verse, in, in Acts chapter 8, verse number 26 and 27, um, the Holy Spirit is praying for us. That's God, the Holy Spirit. It says, likewise, the, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So even when you struggle to form the right prayers, the Holy Spirit of God is there to pray for you. But it's not just him. Drop down to verse number 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh what? Intercession for us. So the Holy Spirit helps our weaknesses. How? By praying for us. He prays according to the will of God. That's pretty good. And so we must pray that way too. We must learn to pray, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And then we see, as I already read, that Jesus prays for us. Now, think about this. With two members of the Godhead praying for us, and the other member of the Godhead listening, What reason do we have to feel sorry for ourselves? Does God see your problems? Does God know your infirmities, your weaknesses? Yes. And so if we have God the Son and God the Holy Spirit praying for us and God the Father listening, um, we're in pretty good hands, aren't we? Is he going to allow anything to happen to us that's not for his glory and our best benefit? No. We have to learn to trust him. And that's where it gets, the rubber meets the road. It's called faith. And it's not easy to exercise faith. Faith is pretty difficult at times. It can be very uncomfortable at times. But if you're in the midst of a pity party, I can tell you one thing. You just need to cancel it because God is on your side and he's praying for you. Let's look at the next uh, idea here. We see God's, um, uh, this is the sixth idea here. Last, uh, fifth was God's prayer. Now we see God's plan. Find this in 28 and verse 29. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I've got those two last words Underline in my Bible, his purpose. God has a plan, okay? And then uh, part of his plan is found there in verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, just think about that. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. God wants us to be more like who? Jesus. Well, Think with me. Did Jesus have any problems on this life, on this, while he was on this earth? Yes. And so if we're going to be conformed to the image of his son, hmm, probably going to go through a little persecution here and there. And people who might not like us or understand us or whatever. And it's always a blessing to see, read how Christ handled every interaction that he had with people. He always handled it properly. Do we? No, we don't. But we need to allow God to make us more like the Lord. So God is, is for us. He's not against us. God has a plan. And all things work together for good to them that love God. Right to them who are the called according to his purpose, to those who are really saved. So he can take tragedies and turn them to triumph. And he does that often. 
we don't we like the the victories but we don't like the valleys do we he works all things even those disappointments of life out for good which brings us to another thought and it's more applicable to uh this generation this generation we are living in the generation of uh people who use the victim card did you know everyone's a victim now and if if you're a victim then you have a right to be the way you are you don't really have to change you have a right you have an excuse for being what you are and i'm saying that facetiously you don't really have any right um living the life of a victim is terrible because it allows people to make excuses for themselves and people who live as the victim usually live in the pit don't they they live their life having pity parties for themselves oh so and so did this to me so and so said this about me this thing happened to me i was slighted here i was um whatever and they say well this bad thing happened to me and and that's why i have so many problems right that's the men- victim mentality this bad thing happened to me and that's why i have so many problems that's not romans 8:28 the per- a good christian and let's bad things are going to happen to every one of us i've had a lot of bad things happen to me and there's some people in here who've had worse things happen to them and i'm i'm not mitigating that i feel bad for anyone who has had bad things happen to them but a good christian will say not this bad thing happened to me and that's why i have so many problems that's the way i am why i am no a good christian's going to say this bad thing happened to me but god would not have allowed it if he didn't have a a good plan to have something better f- for me come out of it the bad thing happened to me yes but he wouldn't allow it if he didn't intend for some good to come from it that's how we ought to look at it and having a victim mentality leads to a miserable life and one big unhappy pity party because the victims always going around looking for people to feel sorry for them and they may get a little help here for a while and a little help here for a while and a little help here for a while but if someone doesn't want to have victory over their pity party and they want to just roll around in the pit people get tired of that so Paul looked and saw God's plan. And God's plan was this. All things work together for good. We're going to have problems. We're going to have disappointments. We're going to be dis- discouraged at times. We need to get our eyes off of that, get our eyes back on the Lord and say, "Lord, you would not have allowed this unless you had a plan for it, and I need to trust you in it." Then brings us to uh the next one. We only have two more. uh God's provision we find this in uh verses 31 and 32 so what shall we say then to these things if God be for us and he is who can be against us now i love the next verse also he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things all right the lord has already given us his best he didn't spare his son that is his best so if he gave us his best he said what else wouldn't i give you if you needed it and then this assures us that he's going to give us all that is necessary for the future maybe not all of our wants but all that 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 we truly need and a lot of our pity parties result because we're we're fretting and fearing we're anxious about not having what we need in this life whether it's materially or uh, could be relationships whatever it is i but i need this 
I need this person, I need this money, I need this thing, I need this. And they say, oh, hey, just hold on. If I didn't, I didn't spare my best, why won't I, why don't you just wait for me and let me give you what you need? But we get anxious, we get in the pit, we feel sorry for ourselves, we take things into our own hands, right? I need this. And we go out and buy something, get in debt, and then we're in trouble. Ah. <laughs> well, we race ahead of the Lord in different areas and get ourselves in trouble. And that's not God's plan. And so if he's, he's going to provide what's needed when it's needed, don't get ahead of him. Amen? So if that's the case, he's going to meet our needs and we don't have to feel sorry for ourselves. We can, by faith, look to him, take care of our needs, and we see that faith ends our pity parties. I'm going to give you the last point, and that's God's protection. We find this here in verses 35 through the end of the chapter. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We're guaranteed that God will always love us and nothing can hinder that. The biggest problem in the world, the biggest tragedy that you can ever face, has not bereaved you of God's love. It's still there. And if troubles come, he says we're more than conquerors. I don't know how you can be more than a conqueror. A conqueror means you're on top. (laughs) But if God says I can be more than a conqueror, then that's what I want to be. I want to be victorious. And we will be victorious if we're looking to him. And if that is the case, if that's the case, if we're victorious, what do we have to feel sad about? Why can, why, why do we want to have a pity party if we are Victorious. God's love is guaranteed. And if we're loved so much, how can we be discouraged? How can we pout? How can we uh, carry on like God doesn't have a wonderful plan for our lives? And, and, and even when we're facing hardships, how can we not see that God's protecting us from so many things that are against us? And uh, he loves us, he protects us, and we ought to praise him. So in Romans 7, Paul starts out there a little bit discouraged. By the end of Romans chapter 8, he's on the mountaintop. And why, why did that happen? Simply, he got his eyes off of himself and his problems, and he put his eyes on the Lord, and he saw God for who he is And when we see God for who he is, we stop looking at ourselves and our frailties and our troubles and our whole outlook on life can change. And he was victorious and so can we. Now, did that take away all of Paul's problems? Oh, absolutely not. You can read through uh, his epistles and you can see he had a life of troubles. But he had a blessed life And he had a life that he saw God working with him and helping him through his tough times. So we're all going to face troubles, and we can either have a pity party or we can have a prayer meeting, take our eyes off of ourselves, put our eyes on the Lord, 
and then see our problems in light of eternity. And when we do that, life's going to be a lot better. Now, we got to put it to practice. Amen? Next time you start feeling sorry for yourself, hop into Romans 8 and start seeing God. You don't have to do it. Look just in Romans chapter 8. You can get in all sorts of other parts of the Bible. Uh, Psalms are a great place to be. I mean, David wrote many of the Psalms. That man had so many people against him. He had so many problems. And you see him pouring his heart out to God. It seems like, you know, Lord, help me, deliver me, you know. And you find some wonderful nuggets of truth there. And I've, I've tried to close uh, each evening for the last 20-something years, for about the last 20 years, I've tried to close each evening out with just reading in the Psalms, uh, trying to get something from God's Word to help me. And it, it does help. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful again. For the time you've given us, thank you for allowing us to study these truths and I pray that you'd help your people Lord, we all battle self-pity and we, we can have help, we can have strength, we can have deliverance when we look to you. And I would ask, Lord, that you'd help the one who is uh, struggling the most today to get their eyes on you and, and find some real hope. And we pray for some deliverance. And Lord, if there's some that maybe are not saved, that they turn to you and find the wonderful truth of salvation that we don't have to be condemned. And that's not in a church. It's not in a baptism. It's not in a religious ceremony. It's in Christ Jesus. And help us be found in him, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.